the passion, the, the, the love and the fire that I have inside, it's intense, man, it's a lot. I can't help it, it's an addiction, I have to skate. In 1997, a 12-year-old with a skateboard in California's San Fernando Valley had an idea. Paul P. Rod Rodriguez saw an opportunity to combine the greatest attributes of each of his favorite skaters with a penchant for dreaming big that he inherited from his famous father to take himself and the entire sport to another level. Along the way, he would rack up contest wins and iconic video parts, become the legitimizing face of Nike Skate, and then launch a suite of brands in and out of his core discipline. And it all started with one idea. How did your parents' professional life inform your ambitions? You know, growing up the son of a comedian, I got to see someone living out their dream. And that affected me in a big way because I thought that was normal. I thought like living your dream was just what you're supposed to do. I would go to movie sets, I would meet these famous stars. I would watch my dad perform in huge theaters in front of big crowds. From day one, I was already dreaming like big. When I played baseball, I wanted to be the best pitcher. Nolan Ryan was my favorite. Or when I was doing karate, I wanted to do martial arts movies like Van Damme and Bruce Lee. I always just pictured myself trying to be like whoever was the biggest. What are the qualities about yourself that you hold on to the most tightly? My imagination, my capacity to dream. I still daydream all the time, like as if I was, you know, a kid. It just lights a fire inside of me to a point where I have to physically work towards it till it becomes real. So I know you started skating around your 12th birthday. What was the feeling that you got that drew you so sort of instantly to it? It wasn't quite a sport and it wasn't fully an art. It was a nice blend, you know, of like athleticism and creativity. At first I didn't even, I hadn't seen magazines or videos yet, didn't know it was like a thing you can do that was like really? professional. I just saw kids at school doing it and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world because like I couldn't understand how they can make the board stick with their feet or how they can flip it and land back on it. And it was like, you know, when you see a magician do a magic trick and you're like, I need to know how that's done. I have to know. What was the process to go from being a 12 year old that has like just gotten on their first skateboard to getting, you know, your first pro looks. Immediately I fell in love. Anytime I wasn't in school, I was skating. Anytime I wasn't asleep, I was skating. Uh, it was just nonstop obsession. And then after maybe two years of that, a friend of mine who I became close with through skating had an older cousin who used to skate and he would show us old skate videos and I'll be like, what? They're professionals and they'll see magazine, what? You can do this for a job? I was like, I have to do this. This has to be my job. I can't not do this. Once I started seeing videos and magazines, then I really started progressing a little more. Uh, and I learned about sponsorships. So I went to the local skate shop and they had an A, B and C team. I made the C team when like, mm -hmm. like, you know, my first tryout, that was all I needed. That little bit, that little bit of encouragement, the C team, which didn't really give me any benefit, you know, <laughs> just to say that you're associated with that skate shop. Um, but that's all I did, like, Mom, I got my first sponsor, I'm on the C team. How long did it take before you realized that you had an unusual or extraordinary gift? It didn't happen right away in the sense of when other people started telling me that, like, I was good. But luckily, I was always dreaming big, like I was saying before, I just, Envision myself trying to be one of the top guys and I just went after it So it I didn't necessarily know if I had talent or not and that wasn't even important to me It was just like somehow I was like I'm going to be that um, And I'm thankful that I had that kind of naive confidence Were your parents on board for this? I grew up living with my mom and she was real supportive and let me do um, And explore hobbies and things but my dad when I told him I wanted to be a pro skater he was like son you can't have a career doing that. Look, it's fun, you're having fun, enjoy yourself, but like, 
you know, at some point when you get older, you're going to have to find out what you want to do. And I had to flip it on my like, dad. You're a guy who was born in Mexico, immigrated to this country as a little kid and became a stand up comedian who took care of his whole family. What did your parents say when you told you're going to tell jokes for a living to pay for the bills? And like, I, I remember it clear as day. <laughs> he was he was actually the first time I ever seen him speechless because he's always got a witty comeback for everything. He had nothing to say. And he just said, you're right. My mom and Uncle Dave were my first early supporters. And my Uncle Dave, he lived with us and he would take me to skate parks. He would take me to like my first contest. He would book hotels out of his own pocket. My Uncle Dave let me borrow his camcorder and we'd been filming each other and making like a little video of our tricks. And without me knowing, my friend Kevin took our video to this other skate shop, 118 skate shop. As far as we were concerned, like the pro level skaters skated with them. So we went and skated with them. And at the end of the day, it was like, so do you guys want to be sponsored by 118 Skate Shop? And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was my first like real sponsor. But through them, they were connected with actual skate brands. They had the sales reps coming in and they had connections to guys there. So I ended up giving um, my next sponsor me tape to this guy at DVS Footwear. And um, they put me on the flow team where they, they give you like two, three pairs of shoes a month. I was like, oh, this is it. We're going places. <laughs> a friend of mine there, Steve, ended up getting sponsored by this board company called Status. Status Skateboards also had a sister company called DNA Skateboards. He was in San Diego and he called me and he says, hey, they want to put you on DNA Skateboards. I was like, really? I can get to be flow? He's like, no, they want to put you amateur on their actual team. What? I was tripping, so the next weekend, he takes me down to San Diego. I meet the guys there. They give me my first free skateboards. They give me like five boards and all the t-shirts I want, stickers, and I'm just like, oh my God. I take the box home and I sleep with all the stuff in my bed. I like snuggled up my, my free skateboards and all that. They gave me my first ad in the magazine, gave me my first video part in a video that actually was in skate shops. As you're making these different video parts, what was your strategy? The filming never stopped. It was just like, oh, deadline's here? Okay, here, take this, because I'm still going. Oh, here, just take this, and I'm still going. Like, it was just nonstop. And um, my approach was just to learn new tricks and try to make them look good. Like, that was really what was embedded into my head by the older guys, especially by my, my friend Nigel. He was like, look, man, anybody can do tricks. Anybody can do hard tricks. But if they don't look good, it means nothing from the way you're dressing and from the way your body actually, like the form of the trick. You know, one guy might do the same trick, but it looks like it's so hard, like he's struggling. And another guy might do it and it looks like he's just smooth, like just finesse and flowing. Even if you do a less hard trick, this guy's doing a super hard trick, but you make the less hard trick look better, that means more because that means that you've got good enough at this trick to where you've mastered it. So that always stuck with me, so. I always just try to make my style and everything be fluid and smooth and polished. In your head, what were you thinking like you want your style to be like? At one point, I just wanted to be Tom Penny. He dressed the coolest. He looked like he was asleep while he was skating. He looked like he never messed up. And he was just the most legendary. The way everyone would talk about him as if he didn't even really exist. He was a myth. He was like Santa Claus. Like The legend is Tom went to this spot, didn't even look at it did the trick down the stairs first try, didn't even look at the stairs, he just did it. And legend, he did this, he did that, and you would just hear these stories like, man, I wanna be a legend like Tom, like, I would wanna be talked about like that, that'd be cool. Also, Eric Costin, Eric's the best. When you think of the best, it's just Costin. And Eric was just constantly progressing on handrails, nolly, switch, and, and fakie stuff, he was constantly progressing. He was the most precise skater, and then, of course, Andrew Reynolds, he started blowing up during that time and he was jumping downstairs, biggest stairs, and I was like, I need, a, I need a piece of Andrew Reynolds too in my recipe. Once I got older, I realized like, instead of wanting to be another one of these guys, being a copy of this guy, which you can never be as good or better a copy of someone, I realized like, well, I'm just gonna take a piece of all of my favorites and try to put him into me and create my own recipe so that I can be the original me. When did you feel like you found that voice? About 17, 18, 
I got a little taller from when I was 15 and a little more strength in my legs. People weren't saying I was good for a little kid anymore. They were just like, oh, this is good. How old were you when you felt like that you were really fully a professional? My name on a board. When I was 17, I got turned pro okay. for Girl Skateboards, which was the most prestigious company at the time. And that's when I felt like, wow, like I'm, I'm on the team with Costin, my hero. And then I got on S Footwear, which also Costin was on. And at one point, I had all the same sponsors that Costin had. That's when I felt like, wow, I'm, I'm in the game. I made it, I'm, I'm a pro. And then Nike came knocking and I had to take that opportunity. After its initial attempt in the 90s to enter the insular world of skateboarding fell short, Nike regrouped in the early aughts under the leadership of visionary exec Sandy Bodecker. This time, the brand made P-Rod the face of its efforts and the results would revolutionize the worlds of skating and sneakers. Not to mention the transformative effect it would have on Paul's life and career as well. Nike and Nike SB and your role in their ascent is incredibly important. They tried uh, to get in the skate space in the 90s and failed somewhat notoriously. Yeah. <laughs> what were those initial conversations like and how did you know that they were gonna get it right this time? When Nike first approached me to be part of the program, I mean, they took me down to the campus. When you go on the tour of the campus, you're just like jaw dropped, yeah. like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. It's the Michael Jordan building, the Tiger Woods building, the Serena building. You're just like, what is going on? And then they brought me to Sandy's office. Oh, here's a side note, funny story. I, so I used to be terrified of flying. And just for the two hour flight to Portland, my strategy was I'm gonna stay up all night. So when I get on the plane, I'll be so tired I'll fall asleep so I won't have to be scared. Of course, it doesn't work. I stay up all night, I get on the plane, I can't fall asleep because I'm scared. We're in Sandy's office. I forget however long into it, he's talking to me and I'm doing this. <laughs> I'm falling asleep on Sandy Bodecker, like, like, and my manager is like, like hitting me and I'm like, oh shit, like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I had to explain to him, like, I'm sorry, I'm scared of flying. I don't mean to be disrespectful, I felt so bad. Sandy had the coolest office with the craziest artwork and toys everywhere and his desk sitting there and telling me, you know, like how much they wanted me to be a part of Nike. And I'm like, this Nike, like you want me? So on the flight home, talking to my manager, I was like, this is so awesome, I gotta do this. So she starts negotiating and everything. So she calls me back a couple days later. Hey, uh, they said they're, they're not doing shoes. They're, they're not planning on doing any signature shoes for skateboarding. I was like, oh, well then, then I can't do it. Cause I was already skating samples of shoes with my name on it with my other sponsor. And to me, you're not a official pro skater unless you have your signature board and your signature shoes. However long later, a week or so later, she came back and said, okay, they said they'll, they'll give you a shoe. And I said, let's do it. What was the perception from your peers and from the rest of the industry? It's a very insular scene. Yeah. And Nike is looked at as sort of like the Goliath. At that, you know, people had certain things to say, you know, you throwing out the sellout label there for, for a little bit or whatever. But to me, selling out is doing something that's against your morals or against who you are. That's not you. Nike has been part of my life since day one. That's doesn't feel wrong to me. So yeah, it was, it was some mumbling, but that, that died quickly. And then all of a sudden, everybody wanted to get on Nike and Nike was the most sought after sponsor for skaters. That was the number one thing they wanted to be a part of. How do I process criticism? Um, I just don't. People's opinion of me doesn't really affect me too much, good or bad. You know, I'm grateful if someone has something nice to say about me, that's great. But I don't, I don't move based on a good or bad opinion of me. I go based on that, the joy that's going on inside of me here. How did your career change after that alignment? Oh man, it changed a lot. I went from being like, well known just in skate world to all of a sudden like I'm starting to be known outside of the skate world. They had me doing events with Kobe and Serena and I'm sitting here with these like icons and I'm just sitting in between them like what am I doing here like this is crazy. 
So it took me to a whole nother level. It, it made me like, I guess, attractive to other sponsors. Ended up getting drink sponsors and cell phone sponsors and the way Nike elevated me uh, helped out a lot with that. What was that like interacting with the Serena Williams and the Kobe's and the LeBron's of the world? It was just like a, a big fantasy, a big dream. I still look at them like, here, you know? And, but to me, I, that's fun to me. I love being starstruck. It's, it's inspiring to me. I get it, some people are like, oh, they're just, you know, there's normal people just like you and me. Like, no, they're not. Yes, they have arms and legs like you and me, but what's different is here. They're different here. They, they're cut from a different cloth. They got a different mindset, different heart. Some people would say that you are cut from a different cloth though as well. And like, there are things that separate you from all of your competitive peers who you were coming up with, right? What do you think that is? I don't know. I, I, I can't feel what another person feels inside of them, but all I know is the passion, the, the, the love and the fire that I have inside, it's intense, man, it's a lot. I can't help it, it's an addiction. I have to skate. I'm compelled to skate, you know? Like, I'm depressed if I can't skate. I would imagine it's probably similar for a Kobe or a Jordan, who, name yeah. whoever, because, you know, you, you become very unbalanced. There's a lot of family relationships I never cultivated on because I was too locked in or certain things that I never experienced that maybe my friends who weren't living that kind of way experienced. You had a child at a fairly young age, you were 23, 24 years old. How did that change how you thought about your professional life? It really didn't change too much how I thought about my professional life because at that time, especially, I was like fire hot in my prime. Earning potential was great. It was more so um, on a human level. Like I knew that I could give a child love and care for a child, but like I also knew that I was still a child. And, I, and even still now I'm learning I was 12 years old and I'm still in the same career from when I'm 12 years old. So like there's certain things about me that are still basically stuck as a 12 year old that somebody else may have learned not l living the way I was living, you know, like somebody who had to grow up and mature and go to college and you had these certain experiences and you learn certain dynamics or maybe somebody who had really close relationship with their parents or especially their father. Like I knew my father my whole life, but I didn't know him. I didn't, wasn't raised by him. He was sort of in his peak or his prime at that moment during your childhood and obviously that affected the amount of time that you could spend with him and the relationship that you guys ultimately would have. Did that weigh in how you approached parenting? Yeah, for sure. And don't get me wrong, I, I don't fault my dad at all. I, I have no animosity or anger towards my dad, especially now having had the type of career I have and having so many similarities to our careers as far as time consuming and travel wise and the attention span that it takes to be great at your craft but you know when i would see my dad i'll be still kind of like nervous like you know okay i'm only gonna have this amount of time with him i wonder what we're gonna do are we gonna go to disneyland or do this or that whatever you know because whenever i seen him it was like okay we have to do something it was never just normal like kick it around the house type days because we didn't see each other regularly enough for those moments you know i definitely make sure that my daughter knows me i'm present in her life i think success is just being happy within yourself being content within yourself having people around you that you love that you that you like spending your time with and just feeling joy inside, whatever form that comes in, you know. What was the catalyst to starting your own brand, Primitive? Primitive started in 2008. I was 23. My founding partner, um, he was the guy who actually managed the skate shop I told you about at the beginning, 118 Skate Shop. Once I signed with Nike, he had already been saying, hey, we need to open up a sneaker store. Let's open a sneaker shop. And, when I was 19, just signed with Nike, I was like, man, I couldn't be bothered with that. I, I don't know anything about this. This sounds crazy. I don't know how I can't do that. But finally around 22, I was like, all right, I need to figure out how to set myself up for life after skateboarding. Started discussing how to open up a, a store. And 
I talked to Nike and they weren't just like, okay, here you go. They were like, well, dude, like, let's see if you're serious. They're like, bring us a business plan. Tell us what your vision is and everything. So we went um, to a CPA who is now actually our CEO now. Oh, really? uh, he wrote our business plan for us. We brought it to Nike. We had a location where we wanted to go and, and they were like, wow, like this is actually a real business plan. We were impressed. They granted us the right to sell Nike and once we got Nike, then we were able to get the other shoe brands, get other clothing brands, and it all kind of come together. And we wanted to open up here in the Valley because we knew like Melrose and Fairfax was already like locked down by those guys over there. I was like, but like Ventura Boulevard, that's our Melrose and Fairfax of the Valley. So let's have a spot out here. So we started as a store and uh, slowly made shirts and sweaters and hats and other stores would ask if they can carry our shirts or sweaters and hats. And, Little by little, a couple other stores had us, and then, you know, we ended up getting a meeting with Zoomies, and they gave us a trial run, and that's where it, like, really progressed. When did Primitive start having its own skate team and really becoming this sort of 360 brand? 2014, we started, we launched Primitive Skateboards. I realized at that time I was maybe 28. I was one of the names in skateboarding that was able to be marketable and move product well for my other brands. So I was like, I think if I start my own board brand, it will have a chance at doing well. You know, been able to establish ourselves now going on eight years as, you know, one of the top skateboard brands in our industry. As you've progressed in your career, you have diversified your revenue streams and created a number of different businesses on the side. One of them that was a sort of fairly big success was the beer brand, uh, St. Archer. How did you get involved in that? My, my very close friend, former pro skater, Mikey Taylor, he went on a surf trip with this guy, uh, Josh Landon. They were like, you know, we should start a brand. I think we would work together as a brand. And they were talking about like, should we do a clothing brand? Nah, there's a million clothing brands in our industry, you know, like sunglasses, nah, there's a bunch of those. Like, what about beer? Like, we love beer. Surfers, skaters, snowboarders, we love beer. And, and Mikey uh, texts me like, hey, I want to meet up with you. Um, me and Josh want to pitch you something. All right, cool. So I go meet up with them at a Starbucks in Thousand Oaks. Like, we want to start a beer brand. And I'm like, cool, let's do it. And we had no idea what this entails, but we're like, think about it. There's no beer brand started by skaters. We all have contacts in skate, surf, snow. We can be the brand of action sports, you know? And we're like, yeah, sounds great, cool. So we start going down the process and, you know, investigating what it takes to start a beer brand and we're going to contract brew where other people who make beer brew it for us, put our labels on the bottle. And we're like, oh yeah, we'll just do it like that and we'll sell them. And then we found out the margins on that were like pretty much nothing. And you had to sell like astronomical numbers just to make any type of profit. So we kind of lost the wind out of our sales, but we went down the path of seeing what it would cost to open your own brewery. Found out what those numbers were and we set out to go raise some money. I'd never been a part of a capital raise before. I didn't even know what that was, you know? So me and Mikey were the first initial investors. We invested our own money to get Josh um, so that he can quit his job, move to San Diego and go full in with St. Archer. And from there, Josh just turned into a beer genius and he studied the game and knew everything about it. And he went after it and uh, we ended up raising that money and we ended up opening up our own brewery. Maybe two and a half, three years after it opened, uh, Coors came knocking, Budweiser came knocking, we had a little bid, Coors felt like the better match and ended up letting it go. On the one hand, it's incredible to exit from a business very quickly. On the other hand, you know, one has to be concerned that they're leaving stuff on the table. So what were the sort of uh, considerations in your head? The way I understood at the time is, we can either consider selling now to one of these big brands, make really good uh, return on our investment, or we can try and grow like we saw some other craft beer brands and be worth 100, 200, 300 million, whatever the case may be. But that would take us raising another 10, 15 million dollars. And I didn't know at the time, and it took me a while to understand this, but like when you raise that kind of money and you can't invest to keep up with that raise, your percentage in the company gets diluted and you lo lower your percentage of ownership. So we were like, let's do this. Let's make our money. 
take it off the table and we can do something else, you know, start something else. Jay Z is probably the person who I try to model my career after taking ownership of yourself and uh, being in control of your own destiny as far as business goes. Were there ever any deals that got put in front of you that you just felt like, I, I can't do this? Uh, definitely turned down probably a lot more stuff than I said yes to. Uh, not only because it wasn't something I don't, uh, that I'm into, but also just because of time, man. You only have so much bandwidth, especially when it's something that requires your physical ability. Like, I can only do so much for so many sponsors before my body is just ran down and burnt out. Have you ever gone through a period where you felt burnt out? Yeah, definitely. About 2016, I decided to not skate competitions. Um, at that time, I thought I was done with skating contests altogether. I just didn't feel the drive for it. I didn't, I didn't feel it. Like, why show up to a contest if you don't feel like even putting your best foot forward, you know? I had already been skating contests for, I think, for like 13 years straight, nonstop. Every summer, I skated every contest, X Games, do tour, Street League, plus putting out video parts, plus touring the world, plus doing demos and everything. It took me until 2018 when I, when I blew out my knee to realize that I had been burnt out. That's like, I was confused during that time. Like, what happened? Where did it go? Like, where's the fire? That's when I decided to dedicate myself to my recovery. No way I'm going out like this. I'm not retiring. This is my new challenge. This is my new obstacle. Rehab myself, get back in the game. Then all of a sudden I felt the the fire starting to grow and grow and grow. I'm like, okay, I got something. I got a new challenge. I had, I guess I realized I didn't have anything to chase anymore. After suffering tears to both his ACL and MCL, as well as his meniscus, Paul spent nearly two years recovering. The time away gave P-Rod an opportunity to renew his love for skating and to explore new business opportunities in familiar places. You're now in your mid-30s. For a normal person, you would be mid-career or like early mid-career. <laughs> For a professional athlete, you're sort of... You On know, borrowed time. <laughs> yeah. How are you thinking about this sort of final stage of your, you know, active hmm. professional career as a skater, of course? I'm appreciating it a hell of a lot more. I'm, I'm so grateful for it. I'm actually so, like so sentimental. I've become really emotional and mushy lately, like, I'll watch old videos, see old pictures, I'll feel my my eyes welling up and start like getting teary eyed and like oh dude. But it's like happy. It's happiness. I just I just hard for me to fathom that it's already at this point. A lot of like basketball players as they get older, they change their game, right? Yeah. Like less driving, better three point shooting, better jump shots. Yeah. Have you adjusted sort of your approach? I'm starting to, but I, I definitely I'm well aware that like I have to adjust how I skate but can still be good but be good in a different way. For me it would have to be just going going heavier on the technical side of skateboarding with the ledges, um, flip in, flip out type tricks um, and, and you know at some point a little bit less of the jumping down the stairs but <laughs> thank god that's still there. I just want to still be considered relevant and still be considered like no, Paul can still skate. I don't want to be that dude that like, oh, remember when he used to be, remember when he used to be this guy, that guy? Oh, that hurts my soul. But um, I feel like I still have gas in the tank to still be relevant. What is it like to have been, you know, like a teenage phenom and now be a man in your mid thirties signing teenage phenoms to your team? That's a really, um, fulfilling feeling because it's like full circle. I remember being that kid. I know what this means to sign someone, especially now where Primitive is, you know, when somebody is on the team, it lets the rest of the industry know, like, no, this person is for real. This person is somebody to look at. What do you look for when you're picking, you know, people to be on the team? I look for a feeling, man. I look for a feeling that I get when I watch someone skate. 
I would imagine it's similar to you know somebody finding a musical artist that they feel like they is a superstar and needs to get them like an A and R finds somebody and wants to get them signed. Like I don't have like a just a list of things. It's just it's got to be a feeling, a, a charisma, a style, a, the way they do the tricks. Sometimes it's just the way a person pushes. Sometimes something that I can't even explain. I just am like, no, nah, this this person is primitive. How do you tell a good idea from a bad idea? I, I go with feeling, uh, my gut. When I have an idea and it just feels right and I just feel it vibrating inside, then I, it, I, just, I just know. Bad ideas, like say for an in investment standpoint, I think it's because you're thinking too much about making money. If you're only just thinking like the end result of just what you'll get from it, I think that spawns a lot of bad ideas. You've recently gotten into lemon ranching. Yeah. Tell me, t how, do, how does one uh, end up the proprietor of a lemon ranch? My father, when he uh, first started um, making some money, he bought my grandparents' uh, ranch up north, Northern California, 40 acres. There was three houses on the property. All his brothers and sisters moved in, his parents moved in. So I grew up going there. One day my dad calls me maybe five, six years ago, and he says, you know, he was considering selling the ranch. You know, you can make some good money off of it. It's I just held the property for a long time. And I was like, no, dad, dad, you can't, please. Well, he's like, do you want to buy it? I was like, Shh, I don't know. That's, I don't know if I'm ready for that kind of investment, dad. I, don't, I wouldn't know what the first thing to do. Then I remembered um, my, my ex-girlfriend, her best friend's father, who I had ended up becoming good friends with, called him Psycho Eddie. So I <laughs> hit it off with Psycho Eddie. We'd have some beers. He'd be cooking up barbecues. and. He's just a cool, cool character, but they lived out in Oxnard and he had lemons and avocados and trees, all that, horses, everything. He might know something about this. Let me, let me call Psycho Eddie up. And hey, Eddie, um, you know, told him all about the property. So he's like, oh, you know what? I'll go with you. Let's go check out the property and I'll tell you what I think. So we drive up there, check the land out, look at it, he sees everything. And he tells me, he's like, you know what? I think this land has some serious potential. The market's pretty pretty profitable in fruit. All right, you know, let's let's go for it. So I invest into it, buy brand new 40 acres of brand new lemon trees from baby, they're baby trees, get a whole new irrigation system. I mean, I'm putting some money into it, like, I hope this works, you know? And we end up doing a deal with this packing house out there that they come, they bring their people, they pick all the stuff for you, and then they pay you a price per bin, you know? Eddie actually relocated from Oxnard, bought a house up next to the property, and um, he manages it, he runs it. And what I like about it is like, it has nothing to do with trends or cool or not cool, it's lemons. Lemons ain't going out of style, they're not going out <laughs> of fashion, they're lemons. People, as far as I can tell, people are gonna always use lemons. You're obviously a fairly accomplished entrepreneur, but you don't consider yourself an entrepreneur. No, I'm not an entrepreneur. Uh, I consider myself an investor. I want to be an investor. The reason why I say that is because I'm lazy. 100% lazy. Um, I know people who crush 100, 200 emails a day. I barely answer my text messages, you know, and I'm just not a, I'm just not built like that, getting out there and negotiating. I'm, you know, like making tough decisions, having to fire people, hire people. That kills me. I want to, uh, invest my money and make my money work for me. You know, I've been working long enough for the money. I want to let, let my money uh, do the work for me. What does money mean to me? Mm, freedom. I can live life on my own terms. Um, go where I want to go. Hang out with who I want to hang out with. Do things I feel like doing. Kind of just being my own boss. How are you thinking about the next phase of your life? I'll be honest, man, it, it, it scares me, the next phase of my life. I'm terrified of it because this is all I've known since 12 years old. I've been very fortunate. I've never had a job, never had a job application or worked anywhere. But that being said, I feel like I've luckily, thank God, had the mindset early on of trying to set myself up for that inevitable time so I think as far as being able to maintain my lifestyle after skateboarding 
I'm, I feel comfortable that that's gonna be fine. It's more so like, what am I gonna do with myself? What, what, where am I, gonna, I, I still have so much passion in me. Like, where am I gonna put that passion? Where am I gonna put that fire? Um, I do enjoy acting. I was doing acting classes for about four years up until the pandemic hit. I haven't gone back since pandemic because that's when my knee finally got healthy and I fell right full blown into skating. Like, I just, I'm just like, I need, skating needs all my attention right now. But I do have dreams of becoming an actor. And I feel like after I've fully got everything out of my system of skateboarding, whenever that is, that might be a place that I'll be able to put my full effort towards. But right now I'm, st I'm still like trying to be in denial <laughs> that you ever have to stop skating at a high level. If you were to pull aside, you know, a 16 year old who has the talent and the determination and the aspiration to do what you did, what are the most important things that you would want to sort of impart on them? Just hold on to that passion. Hold on to those dreams. Hold on to them. Because if you get too into it, it becomes too normalized before you realize they faded away. And you have to work really hard to go back and find them. And sometimes it doesn't come back. You know, some people never find their way back to that. Don't lose that. Keep it strong. Keep that fire burning. <laughs>